Oh, yeah. There we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our 10th presentation at Clio. So today we have the absolute pleasure to be joined by Daniel, uh, the CEO and founder of VACAT. Uh, before we begin, um, I would just like to remind everyone that this presentation should last about 30 minutes uh, and will be followed by Q&A. So it would really be great if everyone could prepare a few questions to ask to, to really make the, the interaction uh, 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 dynamic and so to really have a good exchange on consulting, on VACAT and on Daniel. Um, also, it's better if everyone has their mics muted, so we have better audio quality. So that would really help. Uh, now let's begin. So, um, Daniel, if 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 we if uh, you and I were physically together, I would I would right now hand you the mic. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, I mean thanks thanks for joining on Sunday. I mean three p.m. or whatever time it is, uh, regard depending on on your location. Um, so. Basically, I mean, for today, uh, like I have a few points on, on, on case studies, which is the main topic uh, of, of the presentation. I mean, I'm also going to do a quick intro. So what are the, who am I? What are the case studies? What are the types? Some tips and mistakes. And then uh, I'll have uh, two or three slides on VACAT. So kind of a new way of, uh, you know, getting into consulting or any other industry uh, that you might be interested in. Uh, and then um, as it was said, we'll follow to the Q and A. So guys, I mean, let's, let's do like a full presentation and then, I mean, we'll have enough time to answer any of your questions. Uh, and uh, I mean, whatever question about uh, consulting uh, cases you may have, uh, feel free to, to, to ask. So, I mean, in terms of my profile, uh, I mean, before founding uh, VACAT and uh, becoming an unpaid CEO, uh, I spent five years in management consulting in two years, more or less, in Oliver Wyman and uh, three in uh, Delta uh, in Dubai and New York offices. So, again, if you will have any questions about those markets, also happy to happy to answer. Uh, during my five years, uh, I've done 12, 13 ish uh, projects uh, across nine countries. I was uh, mostly focused on telco. Um, I mean, Delta, which was my first company uh, that I joined after graduating from London Business School, Delta is uh, kind of focused on, on TMT market. Uh, and then when I moved to Oliver Wyman, I mean, naturally I, I joined uh, the, the TMT team uh, as well. So kind of, I think I have done only one project that was non-TMT related, uh, and that was a banking project. Um, so, I mean, going straight to straight to the uh, cases. Uh, I mean, cases, like I remember when I was a student, I mean, everyone was preparing for cases and, uh, you know, going through all those books and frameworks and uh, getting super stress, stressed out about uh, <laughs> interviews to, to consulting firms. But when it comes to cases, I mean, you may have a thousand different examples, but uh, I think based on my experience, kind of from, from the cases that I've done when I was interviewing, from the cases that I've given as, a, as an interviewer, I mean, there are basically three types of, uh, of cases. Uh, so one of them is an estimation, uh, another one is valuation, and then you, you can have a kind of prioritization uh, case, uh, case studies. And of course, you may have like a mix of all three. So estimation cases, it's, uh, I mean, when, when, when you say estimation, most people think about market sizing. Uh, so, you know, the number, the number of, uh, I don't know, tennis balls that you can put in a, in a uh, Boeing, it's not exactly this. It's more about, you know, how big is the market for a specific company? How much revenue can you generate? What would be the cost associated? How many customers you can get? Uh, if you launch a new product, uh, if you launch a new company in a new market, etc. And I'm going to give a few examples of cases like this um, in, in a few minutes. The valuation cases, it's basically DCF. And uh, actually, I think like 80% of cases that I've, that I've seen, especially when I was, into, when I was uh, applying for an analyst uh, level, 80%, I mean, the vast majority were, were the valuation cases. Uh, so, I mean, I'm going to mention it again later on, but I mean, do know how to do a basic DCF, how to do a break-even estimation. Um, and you can have cases like, you know, valuing a business, valuing a, a project, 
uh, a company wants to buy my company, what like another company wants to buy my company, what should be the uh, the price that I ask, uh, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then the last but not the least uh, prioritization. So it might uh, be a mix of valuations. So for example, uh, you know, we have two projects, which of the or two companies, which of the projects, which of the companies we should go after. And then we can add some um, qualitative assessments to the to the case. Uh, but it's also about common business sense. So you may be given a few initiatives uh, for a company and you would have to assess uh, you know, which initiative would you implement as the first one, uh, which is which initiative is more important. You can have questions about the latest trends, especially if you're applying for companies that are specific, I mean, focus on a specific industry, for example, telco. I mean, you can, you should know, I mean, at least some basic about basics about the local market or, I don't know, 5G. So it might be a question about, you know, which given a few trends, which is the most important uh, strategy that a company should uh, should follow. And then, I mean, the valuation-based prioritization is what I mentioned before. So you would have a different, uh, few different projects that you need to value. You add to that qualitative um, kind of assessment, and then you need to prioritize uh, different, different uh, kind of projects. And I mean, this is basically it. So to be honest, like if I were to give one, one main advice, I would rather focus on practicing that common sense rather than learning by heart all those frameworks uh, from different books um, and uh, so on and so forth. In terms of real examples and why and why consulting consultants use case studies, uh, so a consult a case study during a during a case interview puts you in the shoes of a real engagement manager and of course uh, real projects are much more complex and you would have to do a kind of much more analysis and you would have a team and a manager who would kind of lead the, the entire team uh, but this is a very simplified uh, you know simulation of a real uh, of a real case study a client comes to you with a question and uh, and basically during that 30 40 minute case study you need to give the answer um, to that uh, to that client. So a few cases, and those are actually real oh. cases. Okay. <laughs> so so um, those are the real cases that I've uh, that I've seen. Uh, I think all of them were during my interviews when I was applying to for different for diff to different companies. So for example, uh, you know, a client comes to you and says that he wants to buy a gas station. Uh, or uh, that was actually a land for a gas station. Is that a good idea, idea or not? So this is a clear. This was if using the the kind of the framework, the structure from the previous slide. That's a mix of uh, valuation because we have uh, different cash flows, different costs, and then prioritization, uh, which uh, which strategy is uh, you know the client should follow, or you know estimating a revenue of a of a new telecom entrant in Kuwait. Uh, so here we have, uh, you know, the revenue and cost estimation, a bit of local um, industry knowledge, because you would have to know how many, how many telecom players uh, are in the market. And again, I mean, I was, I was at that point, I was already in the industry for a few years. So that was kind of expected that I would know that, uh, you know, if you design a few initiatives, digitalization initiatives, and then prioritize them using some framework. So again, here, you cannot learn by heart a framework from a book. This is more about the common business sense. Uh, what are the main digital uh, kind of trends and which are the most important, which will bring the most value to the, to the potential client. Um, estimating the price of a local bar that my friend wants to buy. Uh, this was a real case that I've done uh, when I was applying to Delta. So here, you know, how much, how many clients do we have? What's the average price for the drink? For do we sell food, et cetera, et cetera? Or like pure kind of est market estimation um, cases. That was actually not a consulting case. That was for a private equity fund, but a client uh, like a company wants to uh, open an ice cream business in Nigeria. Uh, kind of, is that a good idea? How much revenue they can, they can uh, generate, if any? Um, and why do we have cases in consulting? Because again, during a simplified um, kind of engagement or simulation of an engagement, uh, a company or an interviewer can assess 
the core skills that are expected of you, even when you're an analyst or an intern. So first of all, can you, uh, you know, take the business problem or the business question and put it in a proper structure? And I'm going to mention about structure later on, because this is, I believe, the most important um, kind of part of a case interview. Secondly, you know, can you, do you have that common business sense? Can you think critically? Can you, if you get a question, can you focus on the most important, um, you know, on the most important information? Can you perhaps give an alternative solution? Uh, because when you join a, comp a consulting company, you're kind of expected that, uh, you know, from day one, uh, you will be contributing to the, to your um, project team. Uh, even if you don't know the market, even if you don't have all the skills and all the knowledge, I mean, you have to have that common sense uh, right away. Uh, the basic financial business knowledge. So again, even if you study, um, like, I mean, if you study finance or, or management, uh, business administration, et cetera, et cetera, you probably cover or should cover uh, most of the basics during your uh, academic course. course. If you're studying studying something completely not related, history, arts, etc., it's good to a bit kind of acquire at least the basics on you know what's the revenue, what's the bit uh, how to do a DCF, etc., uh, etc. Et because again, when you join a project, it's kind of expect you don't have to know all the um, you know industry knowledge. It's I mean it's impossible to to join a consulting company and uh, and have all the skills and knowledge that that you would be required on a, on an engagement, but at least knowing the basics would would help a lot. Uh, and hence this is kind of expected uh, and and tested during an interview. Um, you know quantitative skills consulting. Uh, I mean most consulting companies have uh, quite a large quantitative uh, kind of parts on each uh, engagement. Uh, and of course, it's not going to be, I mean, at least I've never seen any uh, kind of mathematical questions that uh, you need to, you need to, you need to calculate something super, super quickly to show how smart kind of what a, what a quant brain you have. It's more about, you know, uh, processing simple, um, simple calculations you know, summing, you know, division, multiplication, uh, percentages and ratios. Uh, so one point, always have your piece of uh, paper and pen. Uh, I mean, if it's a phone interview, have your Excel open as well, uh, because this usually uh, kind of appears on each case. Um, your ability to prioritize analysis. This is super, super important on every case on every kind of engagement project in a proper project in, in, in consulting, I mean, you would be able to, uh, you know, spend months on analyzing data, on analyzing, uh, you know, trends, et cetera, et cetera. But usually you have three months to complete the entire engagement. Therefore, uh, you know, the famous 80-20 approach, you need to focus on what will help you prove your hypothesis or I mean uh, prove prove it wrong. Uh, and during a case study, you also need to focus on what's most important and uh, going into the wrong direction may actually harm your um, kind of interview assessment. Uh, and then the soft skills. So your ability to drive the discussion in a structured manner, manner as if you were talking to a client. And uh, you know, being a, a concise, have giving a concise uh, recommendation and asking for the right questions. So again, this is this is assessing a case study is assessing your ability to become a consultant in a very simplified way. And you need to focus on all those uh, points and master all those points uh, if you want to nail your the, the case uh, component. Um, in terms of a few a few tips uh, and what to do uh, during a case uh, interview, so one the most important thing what I mentioned uh, before is yeah the, hello the, uh, can you can you yeah. thank you yeah sorry about that. Uh, all right. So uh, this is the most important part is that. Martin Clone, Martin Clone, 
It might be uh, like what's the word Zoom? Uh, like those people who join Zoom just to interrupt. I don't know. All right, let's let's try again. Uh, I, I've had it on a on a different call that uh, I mean someone was unmuting and uh, there was some gibberish in the background uh, and he, that person was not able to be muted. Anyway, uh, so the most important thing is the structure uh, because. I mean, every, every consultant knows that uh, if you uh, join the team as an intern or an analyst, you're not going to do the calculations in your head. Uh, you're not going to know everything on day one, but you have to know how to structure uh, the problem and you have to know how to structure the analysis. I would say that this is one of the most important aspects that is assessed during a, a case interview. Therefore, you need to put extra attention to the structure during the entire interview. So first thing, uh, when you are given a case, and I mean cases, uh, most of the cases that I've seen, it's a very simple uh, kind of information that you're being given. Uh, for example, I'm your client and I come to you and I'm telling you that I want to uh, buy a land for a gas station. Is that a right strategy or not? And that's it. Uh, so usually on most of the on most of the cases it's a very simple information and for for more info you need to ask questions on in some other questions you may be given a bit more data so most importantly i mean structure everything that you're be you're being given uh, on paper uh, i mean always write down every piece of information that you that you get and before you start solving the case confirm what you had what, what you got um, the reason for it is because, I mean, of course, you're joining the, 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 the interview, you're stressed. Uh, if you're being given that, I don't know, a company has $100,000 revenue, I mean, chances are that you may misheard it. You may write a million of revenue or whatever different currency. You may write a wrong zero. It's always good to confirm the data that you're being given because if you make a mistake, uh, kind of writing down information, you will be, I mean, your interviewer would tell you kind of that actually it's a wrong number. I mean, it's, it's super simple. And I mean, it happens a lot. If you don't do that uh, and you continue with your, with your analysis and th then you come with the wrong uh, kind of uh, the wrong answer, then, you know, it doesn't put you in a good, in a good light because the, your interviewer might not even know that you've been using wrong, uh, wrong input. So super, super important, always start the case uh, with confirming the data that you've been given. The second uh, super important on, point on structure, always ask for, for a minute to structure your, uh, the process, to structure your hypothesis uh, that you will use during the case. And I mean, even if you think that the case is super simple and, uh, and you already know that, I mean, you should go to the, to the free cash flow and terminal value, and this will be the NPV, et cetera, et cetera. Always take that minute, uh, write down all the possible scenarios that, uh, that can come out of that case. And during, during your, your um, assessment, work with that hypothesis from, from, from the beginning. If you structure it correctly, I mean, I've seen very tricky cases which seem super simple from, from the get-go, but actually they have a few twists in the middle. And uh, if you don't have a right structure and you kind of meet that uh, plot twist in the middle, uh, you may get lost and you may um, come with the, wrong, with the wrong answer. And uh, I mean, coming with the wrong answer does not mean that you will fail because again, during a case study, your interviewer will see your structure and all that point, all, all those things. But if you use the hypothesis-driven approach from the get-go, uh, your chances for solving the case uh, correctly and for kind of getting a positive uh, review after an interview uh, increase drastically. The second, the, the third point that I've seen a lot, uh, both during interviews and when I was practicing cases uh, with some of my friends, is never assume. I mean, you can ask your questions, uh, but do not assume anything. So if you're being given that uh, 
I don't know that uh, a company is generating X, num X uh, number of uh, revenue or, or has X number of, of clients, do not assume that, okay, like I've read somewhere that uh, in that business, the, 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 the gross margin is around 80%. So probably this will be the, the whatever, another number. You can always ask like, does the client, does the interviewer have um, kind of information that you're looking for? If they don't, then you can say, like, okay, let me, like I've read somewhere or I've seen on another case that this is the uh, industry average. So can I assume that, uh, you know, the cost structure or the segmentation will be this and that? Unless, like if you don't ask for, uh, for, for data uh, in the beginning, and if you don't confirm that you can assume um, something during a case study, uh, you're kind of uh, you're facing a big risk that actually your kind of client or your interviewer has the correct assumption. Uh, and I mean, in a in a real engagement, I mean, of course, you can do some research, you can get some data on your own, but everything that is that that comes from from the client, you always try to get it uh, from the client in the first place. So this is all. This is a very common um, common mistake. So always ask questions, uh, never assume uh, anything, unless it's a I mean, basic, right? But uh, that's a, a bit of a different uh, story. Another point is even if a case is super super simple and uh, you know you need to calculate, you need to multiply ten by ten uh, or do ten percent of a hundred, always walk through your calculate. I mean, always walk your interviewer through your calculations. Like so, so mention out loud that uh, you know we have a hundred dollars revenue, but uh, our our uh, margin is ten percent. The four, 10, 100 times 10% is 10, and we move to the next uh, to the next step. It's something that many, many people don't do uh, because, I mean, you're multiplying 100 by 10%. So it's, uh, it's, it should be simple enough uh, that, uh, you know, you, you can do it in your head. But I mean, again, you're in a stressful environment. You're doing a, a, an interview with a company that, uh, I'm, you're applied because you, you because you want to work there, uh, you may make that mistake and you will do 10% out of 100 equals 100. Uh, I mean, you, you, you don't have to, but I mean, it happens. Uh, and it's not because you don't know how to count. It's again, you may have a wrong number written down, you're stressed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you walk your interviewer through your even super simple calculations, and if you make a stupid mistake like this, uh, you most likely your interviewer will will mention it and you will correct that mistake uh, immediately. And, uh, you know, most most cases that involve some some uh, quantitative assessment, I mean, they have a few levels of, of calculations. So if you if you spot the mistake in the beginning, the chances that you will derive to a correct answer at the end, uh, I mean, again, they, they, they increase uh, significantly. And if you make a mistake 100 times 10% equals 100, and you correct it as you go, it's much much easier to do so versus when you are five calculations into the case and you're just giving a wrong uh, final answer. Um, then in terms of uh, the final conclusion, always kind of before you give the final conclusion, the final answer, always take a step back and think, I mean, does it make sense? Uh, does it make from a, I mean, from a, from a, a qualitative and quantitative point of view, uh, if it was solved super quickly and the case took five minutes, uh, probably it's wrong. Uh, probably your answer is wrong. And actually the gas station, uh, the land for the gas station uh, case study that, I, that I've mentioned is one of those cases that you can solve in five minutes. Uh, you give the final conclusion, but actually it's, uh, it's absolutely wrong. Uh, so if you if you think that uh, you know either it was too quick or just you know you 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 have the final answer, you, you can always voice over that. Okay, right now I think that this is the this is the the answer. Uh, I mean, this is the information that I've been given. This is the analysis that I've been given. It makes sense from a business perspective. Therefore, this is my final final conclusion. Even if that conclusion is not correct. 
uh, but which may happen. But you take, but you do take that step uh, step back and you assess the bigger pic, the, the 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 famous bigger picture. Uh, it leaves a good impression that uh, you know you can you can approach and structure the problem uh, correctly, and you have that business common sense. And uh, the last one, uh, the last not the least, uh, again, know the basics. So regardless of your, of your kind of academic background, you should know what's revenue, what's COX, EBITDA, DCF, that you have a thermal value when you're doing evaluation of a, of a, of a business project, uh, how to calculate that thermal value. Uh, but again, if you're also involved on the, and to that point, if you're um, applying to a, to a company that is focused on a specific industry or a specific market, uh, you should also know the basics about that industry and that uh, kind of geography. So if you're applying to Dubai office, regardless whether that's McKinsey or, or which is a generalistic company versus Delta, which is a TMT focused company, I mean, you should know, you know, uh, a bit um, the main market in the Middle East for Dubai office is uh, Saudi Arabia. So I mean, you should know at least something. You know that there is a vision 2030 that the mm, country wants to move from oil dependency uh, and so on and so forth. If you're applying for for a London office to Oliver Wyman, for example, which is predominantly focused on uh, financial services. It would be good to know some basics, you know, what are the biggest banks? I don't know if there was a massive news, it would be uh, good to, like in the financial center industry, it would be good to know it. It's not like you will be grilled on that topic, but knowing it gives you a lot of, a lot of points. And uh, I mean, when you're applying and you put your cover letter and you mentioned that you want to work for company A, B, C, D, whatever, because, they operate in a great market that you've been passionate about and uh, they operate in the industry that you, 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 you've you loved since you were a kid, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It would be good to know at least the basics uh, about that industry or market, even if uh, you don't know much, much more about it. Um, and then the last point on the, on the cases. So things that often go, go wrong and uh, things that may, um, if, I mean, if you if you do a few of them, they may significantly impact your your post interview uh, review. The most important, and I, I mean, I cannot stress it enough. I've seen it multiple times. It's the chaotic structure. So I've seen people who come to an interview without a pen and paper, uh, or who are not writing down. The data, the, the the hypothesis, et cetera, et cetera, in a in a structured manner, uh, and I think this is one of the main things, my main reasons why people fail cases. Uh, so that structure, if I were to choose the most important uh, kind of part that you need to uh, practice for your cases, is that structure. I've seen even consultants with a few years of experience trying to move to another company doing case studies and their structure was still not great. So this is again, most important thing to, to, to structure. The second thing, maybe not in terms of importance, but uh, it happens a lot is people forget about segmentation and cannibalization. And uh, this is actually a tip that I've been given when I was a student and I was applying for companies and one of the partners, the partner from the gas station, actually, which I failed uh, completely. Uh, again, like I solved it in five minutes, and oh, this is the this is the the solution. I mean, uh, in the end, I got the offer, and I had a I, I had a chat with that partner, and he said that one two things that he's that he has seen that uh, many students forget is segmentation and cannibalization. So if you were talking about a, a a customer uptake case or a market sizing, you have to remember that so revenue estimation. You have to remember that you know different users, different products have can have different uh, you know assumption, cost structure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when, even when you do a simple case, it's always good to ask about you know if you're selling food in a bar, uh, what would be the cost structure for food? What would be this cost structure for drinks? Do we have any premium drinks or or uh, you know uh, less premium drinks? Do we have any different behavior of of users when it comes to different products? 
even if the case doesn't have that and you will get an answer that you know you can do a simple assumption for all the products it's always good to uh, to mention because it's it shows your uh, kind of business awareness uh, and, and a bit of that, uh, you know, critical thinking, et cetera. And cannibalization, uh, I mean, basically if you're introducing a new product or a new company in a market that you've already, um, you know, operate, you know, some of the users that are buying your product uh, and you introduce a new product, some of your existing users will move towards the new product. Therefore, your old product will lose some of the, some of the revenue. And I've seen a few cases which, uh, which do not mention explicitly the, the cannibalization, but they do have that component to just to check if you if you have that critical thinking and uh, you know bring business awareness that uh, you, that would allow you to to to, to spot that uh, that uh, that missing uh, point in the case study. Another thing is uh, not seeing the bigger picture. And uh, I, th I think this is the most common thing when it comes to valuation cases. You are being given that uh, you know a company wants to buy another company, uh, and what should be the price uh, that you know the, the the enterprise value. And you know many people jump straight to you know what's the revenue, what's the free cash flow, the cost structure, da da yada yada yada, but they don't ask you know what is that company doing, what is the client doing. Are there any synergies uh, between those uh, those parties? Because even if you, uh, even if a business, if, uh, sorry, even if an uh, investment may make uh, sense from a from a purely financial perspective, it may be a complete. Uh, you know, it might be lack lacking that sense from a business perspective. So even if you come to the final conclusion that this is a, a you know NPV positive uh, NPV positive investment. You know, a client should uh, think whether that would bring synergies to the existing business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even if that's not a part of the case, that, uh, you know, not seeing that uh, can reduce some of the kind of points that you get on, a, on an interview. Uh, another point is focusing on wrong stuff and not kind of following the 80-20 approach. Uh, what I mentioned before, an average case, uh, an average engagement is around three months. Uh, so you cannot, uh, as they as they say it's in consulting, uh, boil the ocean. You know, you have to focus, you have to have a hypothesis when you start a case uh, and you have to work around that hy hypothesis. So you can ask about, you know, you can you can do an introduction on the on the uh, quality, for example, it's evaluation case, you have to see the bigger picture, so you have to ask a bit about the, the uh, qualitative uh, information to, to assess the, the sense of the whole thing. But again, you, you cannot overdo it. You cannot spend 10, 15 minutes talking about, uh, you know, the, the non-core non analysis related stuff. Uh, you should mention it, but then you should uh, kind of in a smooth way move to the, to the core part of the case. Um, another thing, not being confident enough or being overconfident, and this is uh, kind of two different uh, aspects that are being uh, assessed. So from day one, you're kind of, I mean, on day one, actually, when you get the staffing, uh, you will fly, travel, whatever, take a bus to a, to a client site, and you will be working, I mean, COVID aside, but you will be working directly with a, with a, with a client. So the company needs to be sure that you're, you can present in a confident enough way, you can ask questions in a confident enough way, and you can present your analysis uh, properly to the client and to the team, because this is, I mean, this is one of the most important things that you do as a consultant. And at the same time, you shouldn't be overconfident, because if you're, uh, you, you know, if you're not a, super likable person and you're super confident, I mean, overconfident or cocky, uh, you know, your team has to spend with you that uh, those, you know, 14 hour, depending on a, on, a, on, a, on a company and case, but let's say 10 to 18 hours a day uh, in the same room. So again, you have to be that, that, that fit uh, is also assessed through cases, how you speak, et cetera, et cetera. And the last point, which I think 
a lot of students kind of the last the last mistake that a lot of students make is using BS frameworks. Uh, you know, I remember when I was at a business school and uh, many of my classmates were studying. Don't remember it's Chang cases, Chang cases. I don't remember the the the, the book, but I mean you have the the frameworks and like the unit cost times times the 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 number of units and you learn it by heart and again if you don't have any business knowledge you should get a work kind of uh, you know the basics but if you start a case uh, let's say a company entering a new market you start a case and you will start with oh like oh the porter's five forces so let's uh, first assess the you know the bargaining power of suppliers i mean that's a that's a very big red flag because in my five years of consulting, I mean, I've never, we've never done a SWOT. We've never done Porter's five forces. This is a really good theoretical, uh, you know, approach. Of course you use some of it, you know, I mean, when a company enters a new market, you need to know what's the regulatory framework and then competition and all that stuff. But I mean, but I mean, you have to apply those frameworks in a in a kind of more natural and uh, business kind of in a, in a way that makes business sense. If you throw frameworks that you learn by heart in a case interview, that's a that's a very big uh, red flag. I mean, to, at least to at least to to me. So that's it when it comes to I see thirty six minutes. That's it when it comes to cases. Uh, I have two more slides about uh, Vakat, and then we will move uh, to to the Q and A, uh, so you can answer any I can answer any questions that you may have. So basically, what is what is Vakat, and I mean why it was created, etc. So when I was a consultant, uh, what I noticed is that uh, I mean let's be honest, many cases uh, on many cases consultants work after hours. And uh, what I realized that there are many tasks that can be done by a junior colleague, by an intern, something that is not kind of conf con confidential uh, and something that will take a few hours, a few days. But companies do not have that ability to staff an extra intern, uh, you know, because we have a bigger research or a bigger document that we need to create. And at the same time, when I was a student, um, I mean, in my case, I've done nine, nine internships just to figure out what career to follow. And I've done it from consulting to private equity, technology, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought that uh, you know, having a freelance platform where companies can uh, give tasks to students would be a good solution to the problem that I had as, as a student. And <laughs> All right. Uh, to a big problem that I had as a, to, that I had as a student, and to a big problem that I had as a as a, a you know analyst and manager, uh, etc. So basically, Vacat is a talent marketplace which works in a very simple way. I'm an analyst at a company. I have a task. Uh, my company has a profile on Vacat. I can post a project, or as we call it, a micro internship, which can be uh, a few hours, a few days, a few weeks, a few months. Students can apply for that project. Uh, they complete that project, and then after after the completion, they get feedback. That feedback is also shared with the uh, HR department, and therefore those students can turn into recruitment leads because the company, the HR, gets you know dozens or hundreds, depending on the company size, validated uh, profiles. I mean, validated because students completed work that had to be done anyway. Um, in terms of the value for students, uh, I mean, every project is paid. I'm going to mention it in a second. How is it paid? But we focus on career building and career exploration. So you can join VACAT even when you're a freshman. Uh, I mean, and you can you can continue using VACAT for as long as you're a student. Uh, you can build your resume from a day one because you complete real projects for real companies. Uh, so while you cannot claim you worked at that given company, you can still put it in your CV that you completed project support, micro internship via VACAT for that company. Secondly, you work directly with, uh, with managers, analysts at these companies. So you expand your network. Um, you get the foot in the door. As I mentioned, 
feedback after each project is shared with the shared with the HR. And some of the comp, for example, Bain and Company mentioned that you know students who get positive feedback would be fast tracked in the in the interview process for summer internships or full time positions. You can test. If, I mean, you can test uh, multiple career options because when you're when you're uh, you know at university, you can attend the company presentations when they will tell you about the the steep learning curve and uh, uh, the collaborative culture that they have and great challenges that they work on. But I mean, it's like at least I wanted to know what do you do on a Monday morning when I come to work? I open my laptop. What would I do? But in a conventional setup, you have three summers, let's say, if you're studying for three, four years, three summers that you can use for internships. Uh, and you have to leverage those company presentations or the career or opinions of other people, friends, career advisors, etc. With VACAT, you can do projects that last for a few hours or a few days, few weeks. You can do it while at university. So you can, uh, you know, test what it's like to work at a consulting company, what it's like to work in an FMCG company, at a startup, what is it like to work in London, in Dubai, in New York, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, the platform is free for students. It's super easy to use. Every project is paid. Uh, you know, you get new skills. You can do it while at university, et cetera. And the last slide, so how is it, uh, how projects are paid? So the rate is centralized and it depends on the skills that you have. When you join the platform, you get $4 an hour, which I mean, is close to nothing, especially when you're uh, based in, uh, in the UK. But I mean, it takes three minutes to set up an account. Uh, you get $4 from after that, those, those three minutes. When you fill your profile, so you need to submit the languages that you speak, about me section, your student societies uh, that you're a part of, your work experience, uh, and your skills and, and submit your CV. So 15 more minutes, you double your rate to $8 an hour. And you also unlock the skill center, which is a catalog of different assessments. So as of now, uh, we have two levels of Excel and we have uh, Python and SQL. Uh, next week, we'll be adding the third level of Excel, uh, SEO, Google Ads, and we are developing your new project, new assessments uh, as we speak. Each of those assessments, if you pass it, if you prove your skill, increases your hourly rate, depending on the complexity, uh, by, by 40 cents, 80 cents, or $1.20 per hour. And the last component is the feedback. So if you complete a project for, uh, for a company, you get feedback after that project. If, for example, you get 10 out of 10, your hourly rate for future projects increases by $1.6. If you get 9 out of 10, your hourly rate increases by $1.2. Um, all right. Uh, so the maximum that you can make on uh, on uh, on Vacat is twenty four dollars an hour, uh, but again we're more focused about career building. Uh, as of now, we have uh, uh, I guess Bunty is very bored, but I'm almost done. So uh, the, the 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 as of now, I mean we launched just last week. Uh, we've already filled uh, three projects, uh, two were for startups, one was an AR, I mean, is an AR VR startup in the US, another one is an esports uh, startup in Singapore, we've also filled one project for, uh, for a consulting uh, boutique in London, they have another, I think, one or two projects that are live, but uh, at least one of them is only for master's students. Uh, we also have currently on the platform a sale uh, climate tech startup uh, that is looking for a sales intern uh, that speaks Spanish. And I mean, we are already in touch with companies like I mentioned Bain, uh, BCG, Unilever, uh, and we are helping them prepare uh, trials. So it's not live yet. I mean, those projects are not live yet, uh, but they are coming to the platform soon. And for everyone, I mean, as of now, the let me share the link because we launched a week and a half ago. Uh, we're still operating uh, in a more uh, controlled manner. So companies can already create profiles for students. We still have a waiting list, which is closing. We were supposed to close it on Friday, but I thought let's, let's keep it until end of day today. The benefit of signing up through that link that I shared on chat 
is that uh, you will get a 10% bonus on every single project that you do. So if your rate is $10 an hour uh, and uh, you work for 10 hours, you will, instead of getting $100, you will get $110. No upper cap, no limit on, on projects. 10% uh, is always for you. The only thing you have to do is to fill the survey uh, that is under the link that I shared. Uh, tomorrow, you will get access to the platform. Uh, tomorrow, probably in the afternoon. And uh, tomorrow in the afternoon or on Tuesday, the platform will become available to everyone, uh, but only people from